Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you I do not know, my name is Micah. It's an honor to welcome you here to North Star for week three of our Tension series. We've talked about the very first two weeks of today's your first time. We said there are some things in life that are not problems to be solved, but they are tensions to be managed. Tensions are not bad things. In fact, tension is a good thing if it's managed correctly. If you handle tension rightly, you can set things just as they should be. If you drive across any bridge, we are thankful that the bridges that are held up by tension, right, they can support you because they have the tension just right. And we're going to talk today about attention. So the very first week we talked about busyness, and margin. We talked about what it lives lives like in this world to have a packed calendar, full schedule, no margin. And then we talked about the tension of well, how do we have margin and how do we how do we live life when we have to work and we have kids' schedules? And that was week one. Week two, we talked about what it means to be in the world but not of the world. So as a Christ follower, when we meet Jesus, he doesn't extract us from this world. In fact, he leaves us in the world. And how do we begin to live in that tension of living for Jesus in the here and now, where we are? We're not in heaven yet. So how do, how do we do that? That was week two. You can go back and catch up with those online. But today, today is the one that if we can get this one, I believe it can change not only your life now, but it can change lives for those that are coming behind you. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you get ahead a little bit, and then we're gonna talk about it. I want you to turn to John chapter six is where we're gonna camp out today. John chapter six, so right over there in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book of the New Testament. If you got it on your phone, you win, right? You get there a little quicker. Uh, you've got your little note sheet. Great, great sheet to have. Probably the best way to follow along is the North Star app. Go to North Star Church, Georgia in the app store, and that is the easiest way to follow along. So today is the tension of living and giving, right? So it takes money to live. Can we all agree with that? It takes money to live. How many of y'all would agree it is more expensive now to live than it's ever been? Right, you've been through a drive through and you're like, we'll just drive through and get something cheap. That'll be $32, right? Have y'all done this recently or they just upcharged me? And then they want a tip. All right, it's unbelievable. The other one, could you go ahead and put a tip on there, sir? It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's crazy. There's nothing cheap anymore. So it's expensive to live. That's just a drive through but we have bills. How many of y'all have bills? Raise your hand. How many of y'all get bills for things you don't even know what they are? All right, raise your hand. There you go. They're like the... Uh, we, we get rid of cable, but then we order all these channels and we don't even know what we have, right? Those, so you got bills, you've got school bills, you've got college tuitions, you've got savings, you've got the stuff of life with insurance and all the things. Listen, living cost money and it is not getting cheaper. That's a fact, Jack, right? It's good. It just takes money to live. Then we read in the Bible where it said it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible teaches giving, and I don't think there's a person that's on this campus in Compass up in True North today, and those of you that are watching online that would say, I don't think it's a good thing to be generous. I don't think there's anybody that would go, no, my goal in life is to be greedy, right? I don't think that's anybody's goal, but there is a tension that we live in, that the, the world that we live in that costs money, right? We gotta pay our bills. God says to give, how in the world do I learn to live in between? So let, let's take it this way. If, if my only view of life is that what I have is mine and it is for me and for my family, I am going to live this way. All right, I want everybody to put their fist out in front of them. I want to live like this. Okay. Is this a comfortable position? Yes or no? 
No, it's not comfortable. In, in fact, it makes you look very angry. I didn't tell you to put them down. All right, go ahead and hold them up. Here we go. All right, it's hard to live this way. It's, it's full of tension. It's full of stress. In fact, when we have not learned to live in the tension, this can overwhelm us. When God says to be generous, I want everybody to do this. Put your hands out. Right? It's to live this way. I believe in every heart, this is how we all want to live. I believe the majority of us in this room want to live this way. But here's the deal. I can't only live here because I got to pay those bills. So the question is, how in the world do I learn to live like this in the tension of living and giving? How do I learn to do this? It is possible, and it's the best thing you might ever learn in this church outside meeting Jesus. So I'm gonna say this as a starter to that. You can put your hands down. No, but if you're still going, would you tell me to put my hands down? I forgot. All right, so you put your hands down now. So let me tell you this, straight up, straight up the top. This is not about North Star needs your money. This has zero to do with it. We are fine. This is about you. This is about your story. This is about your journey. And this is about the legacy that you can live and, and find if you learn to leave and leave and live this way. John chapter six, one of the greatest stories in all the Bible. Here's why we know it's a great story. It's the only miracle recorded in all four gospels outside the resurrection. That's how important it is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record this story. Why do they all record this story? Because it was so significant and God knew in 2023, we would need to get it. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Would you stand with me today in honor of reading God's word together? John picks up the story and it says this, after this, which means some time has passed. So after John 5, we don't know if it's a week, a month, it's not sequential, right? So after this, after some time, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Time out, let's step out of the story. Did they know Jesus was able to do miracles, yes or no? In fact, they so knew it, everybody's following him. Like everywhere this joker goes, great things are happening. All right, let's pick up the story. Then Jesus climbed a hill and he sat down with his disciples around him. So that was Jesus' teaching posture. Anytime Jesus was going to teach a lesson to his disciples, you would see them gather around him and a rabbi would always sit to teach. That's what's happening. And it's just them up on the hill. They're, they're just hanging out with Jesus up on this hill. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, which means there's crowds that are now coming in. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. They knew he was available. They knew he was in the area. Some may have needed sight. Some may have needed to walk. Some may have needed a miracle with a child. Whatever the reason, they've wandered up and they found Jesus there. Turning to Philip, one of the disciples, he asked this question, hey, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Philip, where, where, where is Publix, Kroger? I mean, what we got working today, right? What's all these? Where, where's a good spot to buy bread for all these people? Philip's reply is interesting. I want you to look at verse six, though. Jesus was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. All right, everybody look at me. This miracle was not just about feeding people. This miracle was about teaching a lesson. Don't miss that. That's why that's written in there. This miracle is not just about the people that got to eat that day. This miracle is for the disciples then and for you and I now. Well, Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough to feed them. In Ackworth ease, here's what Philip said. 
Jesus, we ain't got enough money around here to be feeding people like this, basically is what he said. We, we, it would take a small fortune to feed all these people, and we're going to get the number here in a second. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves. It's interesting. Not just the little boy had bread, but here's what you need to know about barley loaves. They were the most inexpensive and least desirable of all breads. That's the bread when you're putting on an event at your house and somebody would bring barley loaves, you're like, really? Don't want you to go out or anything. I mean, I don't want you to have to spend too much money off the hip. That's what barley loaves were. They weren't a big deal. Like barley loaves were the, the bottom of the bread barrel is basically the deal. Well, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. So you're like, dude, Andrew's the man. He gets it. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Isn't that interesting? So Jesus, there, there's an answer here, but yeah, it's not enough. Five barley loaves, two fish. Jesus says then, tell everybody to sit down. And you know, everybody look at me, you know every disciple's like, oh no, here we go, right? He's about, he's about to do something crazy. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about how many? That's a lot of people. You've been around 5,000 people lately? That's a lot of people. I have. I went to Disney. They were in one line at Disney. 5,000 people, a bunch of people. Now, that was just the men. That didn't include the women and children. So you're saying upwards of 10 to 15,000 people sitting on a hillside. That's a lot of people. That's basically almost the bottom bowl of truest. It's a lot of people. Then Jesus, this is, this is a great story. Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks to who? Who does it say? Now, I will tell you this. I've read this story a lot. I've preached it a lot. It's interesting. Jesus did not give thanks after there was enough to feed everybody. He gave thanks for what the little boy brought. That's a powerful lesson in this. He didn't thank the Lord when all his needs were met. He thanked the Lord with what was given. He took the loaves and he gave thanks and he distributed them to the people. And you know the people in the back are like, that's great. We got here in the back. There ain't gonna be any food by the time it gets back here. Afterward, he did the same thing with the fish. And this is, a, this is a, incredible. And it's noted in all four Gospels. Look at what it says. And they all ate as much as they wanted. How many of y'all got somebody in your family when they want a lot, they eat a lot? Y'all got them, right? You just pray they don't hit the dessert bar before you get there. <laughs> don't look at me and say, I bet you're that guy in your family. Don't say that. That's rude and not nice. They all ate as much as they wanted. Afterwards, everybody was full. How many did they begin with? How many loaves? And how many fish? 12 to 15,000 people. They just, just kept having enough. Every time the basket went by, there was enough. Jesus told his disciples, now gather up the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and they filled how many baskets? With scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Father, may you bless the reading of your word today and may it change our lives and our perspectives on how we live in the tension. And Father, I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. Before you're seated, turn around and introduce yourself to somebody around you and we'll get going. All right, so the disciples, 
we're unwilling, unbelieving parts of the story. It's really interesting. Um, remember, the story wasn't just the feeding. The feeding's a miracle. The lesson was for them. Philip spoke up, Andrew spoke up, but I can guarantee you there was a bunch of them in there with opinions. And I can name one, Simon Peter, you know, was at the back going, he's then lost his mind. I mean, Jesus must be hungry because he ain't thinking straight. They gave out all the bread. And I guarantee you, in the loaves and the fish, they stood there knowing they missed it. See, here's what was going through Philip's mind. It's right there in your outline. When I get more, I'll be generous. Philip was willing. He just didn't think he had enough. He didn't think there was any way to get enough. When I get more, I'll be generous. You know, if I had the, the bread truck, if I'd have known to order it today and they'd have pulled up behind me, I'd have been more than happy to share it with the people, but I don't, we really don't have a way to do that. This is, so the modern day version of that is, it's the person that says, if I hit the mega millions jackpot, I'll give money to the church. That is the, the, the 2023, and we would love for you to, by the way, but anyway, so, but the 2023 version of that. When I have enough, I'll be generous. That was Philip. That was where Philip's starting block was. When I have enough, I'll be generous. And we get that. Remember, living takes money. And it's not getting cheaper to live. I mean, it breaks my heart for 20-somethings and 30-somethings buying their first house now in an inflated market. It cost more to live than it did a few years ago. It's just a fact. Well, Mike, one day, one day I would love to live here, but I, I probably need a little bit more. Andrew, I don't have enough to make a difference. See, Andrew's the guy looking around going, well, if I had more, it would matter. But I, I mean, who am I? Why would God want to use somebody like me? We drive by neighborhoods and we drive by places and we go, well, if one day that's my story, then that'd be great. And that's Andrew. But the little boy's the interesting one. Little boy said, all I have belongs to Jesus. He gave up his lunch. Now, did the little boy think he was going to get anything back? No, he's probably going, you know, I'll eat when I get home. But he needs it, so I'll give it. Here's the principle of the day. The best way to live is with open hands. The best way. I'm telling you. For a couple minutes today, this is me as your friend. This is me as um, maybe somebody that's been down the road a little bit longer that can give you some rear view mirror advice of lessons I've learned over the last 30 plus years of marriage and ministry and watching other people. You want to live here, this tension. You are never... I pray one day you can live off 1% of what you make and give away 99%. And there are a few people in my lifetime I've heard that have been able to do that. Most people can't. I got bills and they are realities, but I've got generosity that I want to be. I want to live here. I believe the greatest reason we're afraid to do it is if I live this way, God's not going to give me enough to take care of all these things. I think it's fear. I really do. I do not think it's greed. I don't think people are trying to be greedy. I think most people go, I want to live that way. I'm just afraid that I won't be able to help with my kid's college or I won't be able to help with their first car. Or I won't be able to help pay their wedding one day, whatever that fear is. And we live in this fear. And here's what I'm going to say. I want you to write this down. I'm going to dive in the outline. Ready? Fear and faith are not good friends. In fact, I would tell you fear and faith have a very hard time sharing a room together. I 
I can verbally say I trust God, but until I learn to live, live this way, it's the true test of whether I do or don't. And remember, this is not about North Star. We always say, you know, you give to North Star, you give through North Star. So this, this isn't it. If you go, Mike, I don't trust North Star with my money. Go to a church where you trust them. I, that's what I'm telling you. This isn't about us. This is about your future and your family's future. When my children grew up, this isn't something Ann and I started when our kids were out of the house. This is something that we started way back when we started as a couple. So how do we learn to live this way? Three things. Really simple, but not easy because it takes work. Number one, give God what I have. Wikipedia agrees with me. <laughs> always knew they were listening. I always knew. Somebody, somebody's checking up on my work here. I don't know what's going on. That's funny. I timed that illustration very nicely. Here we go. If I don't give to God what I have, when it's not enough, he'll never trust me with more than enough. If I don't give to God when I don't have enough, I'll never trust him with more than enough. He'll never give me more than enough because he can't trust me. It's like giving a farmer seed, right? A farmer's job is to sow that seed, to put that seed in the ground to see if a harvest comes up. I pulled it this morning just as a reminder. I keep files of craziness. So I have my first offer letter from my first church, very first one had a little place to sign it down there. And I remember it sounded, because when, when you've been a college kid, and I played college baseball, and they weren't paying, people were paying me not to play. But anyway, so I didn't, they, they didn't get paid money while I was in college. So I didn't earn any money much over those four years of college. And Ann and I, I get my first job, and she moved. So I get, we get, I start the job in July of 91, Ann moves down when we get married, October. So really by November, we had moved in, moved in here. And I remember when I got that number, and it was not much. I'm like, oh, this is great. And then I remember sitting down with her. I remember sitting at the kitchen table, writing out our bills. And going, we got more living than I do income. All right, basically you could say, I got more month than I do money. I remember that, that feeling of looking at it going, this doesn't work. Ann and I were both raised, though. When I was little, I, gave, I got an offering envelope. Did y'all ever do this when you were little? And you checked Sunday school attendance, and you checked all the things. And if I earned a dollar, my parents would give me a dime to put in there. And I, we did that every week. Then it turned into $10, became $1, and $100 became $10. And I grew up that way. But it, when, when it's us, I'm like, man, I can't. Given, I remember, I remember making the decision when we didn't. We're going to trust God that we can live in this middle, and He's going to take care of us. I want everybody to look at me. He's taking very good care of us. Why? Because God blesses when we live this way because it means we trust Him. One who is faithful in very little is faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is dishonest in much. God really doesn't want our lunch. He wants a heart. So what do we do? I want you to write this down. Share it. We share it. Don't own something you don't want to share. How many of you have have children or you've had children in your home? Raise your hand. How many, of the, how many of you had to teach your children how to be selfish? Anybody? Did anybody sit your children down and go, listen, if somebody grabs your stuff, you grab it back immediately. Have any of y'all done that? <laughs> have you said, okay, let's split up our duties. You teach on selfishness. 
Teach them how to say the word no. I want, I want you to learn how to say, no, nobody teaches that. We have to teach them how to share. All right? Isn't that funny? On our kitchen counter, we used to have a sponge. Sponge is a great thing, but sponges are only good if they're wrung out, right? If we let it all just seep in, it gets sour, and so does our lives. Give thanks for what I have, even when it's not enough. For some of us, we're going to live in this tension of, Learning to give thanks for what we have, even when it isn't enough. There are some of you, you're sitting in this compass, True North today, chapel, or watching online, and you're like, Mike, I, I am all there. But literally, we have so much debt, we can't do it. I want to, but what do I do? You're here on a perfect Sunday because Jen in here hit this, and y'all hit it in True North just a few minutes ago. I think Sellers hit it up there. We've got new small groups starting up, and we have a financial peace small group. I'm telling you, the best thing you may do for the next six months is sign up for this class and learn how God's view of how to manage your money. It could change your marriage. It could change your life. One of our very own Pete Douglas teaches that, and it has transformed people's lives. You can go right out to the lobby. When this service is over, look it up, financial peace, and make that commitment because you want to live here, right? You want to live in this way. Number two, do whatever the Lord says. path of provision is always the path of obedience. <clears throat> Do whatever the Lord says. If I live here, I'm in fear God's not enough. I've got to learn to live in this tension of, I've got bills. Listen, we, I get it. My, my most exciting part of 2023, I don't have another child to get married. All right, that's the most, most exciting thing of 2023. We've paid for one in 22, paid for 21, and paid for one in 22. So that's a, we've got to raise this year. But anyways, so, but I get, I get the bill thing. I really do. But learning to live here, Bring him what I got. You know what I've learned in 30 something years? He's enough. And he's going to take care of you. You may have heard this story before. If you've heard it, I apologize. I know it has been told here multiple times, but it, it, it is the picture of God's provision over our fear. North Star starting, there was a hot book out called The Prayer of Jabez by Dr. Bruce Wilkinson. Life-changing book. If you've never read it, great, great book. So I get invited to a luncheon down at a mortgage company here in Atlanta where Dr. Bruce is speaking. It was awesome. I'm probably 30, 31 at the time. We're, you know, newbie family people and the kids are little and North Star's starting, ain't got a lot and don't know where our bills are coming from here. And so we get done with Bruce speaking. It was awesome. I invited two friends. We go up uh, to the boardroom and we're sitting on the boardroom and Dr. Wilkerson says, Ike, tell the story of North Star. And so Ike, our founding pastor, paints this amazing story of North Star and what God's doing. And I will never forget this as long as I live in it. I can't not tell the story because it is, it was such a revolutionary time in my life. Um, he said, Dr. Wilkerson said, I believe in it. I believe in the dream. And writes, he writes a $10,000 check zzz, right on the spot. 
puts it on the table, and then this is probably a table of 10 people. Then he goes, how much do y'all believe in the dream of North Star? And the guy next to him who owned the mortgage company goes, I believe in it, I'll give 5,000. Writes a check, drops it on the table. Well, then I've invited two friends. You feel terrible inviting people to something like this. I'm like, oh my God, I feel terrible. And it goes by my friends. Who's that? They don't even live around here. They live on the other side of Atlanta. They just wanted to hear him speak. And they're both like, yep, they believe in it. They dropped five, they dropped 10. It was crazy. But I'm noticing a trend. It's coming my direction. All right, that's what I'm noticing. <laughs> I've never, I've never felt so small in all my life. Good number one, Ann doesn't give me checks to rock around with, all right? And so we were on, true story, and verify, our Discover card had a $500 limit then, true? Because I discovered too many things financially, all right? And so I was on, a, I was on a, quite a tight budget back then. Basically, I thought ATM stood for always taking money. All right? I thought that's what it was, I didn't understand. So anyways, I noticed the trend is coming around. And I'm like, oh, dear Lord, they're going to ask me. Surely they're not going to ask me. I mean, I work at North Star. I'm a child. I'm 15 years younger than everybody in that room. They're not, they're not going to ask me. And, and I'm, you know, how you, you, you're paying it. You're like, like, sort of like praying and putting your head down. Lord, please let, the, please let this pass by. Oh, Lord, Jesus, I'll give you that. I'll go to Africa. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I just please let this go by. And Bruce says, Mike, how much do you believe in the dream? So I remember, you know, I'm pretty good on my feet. I, I remember I knew that we were getting money back on our taxes. And I said, I thought it was around 2000. Basically, I was trying to think of a number and what going to kill me for. That's basically what I'm trying to think of. So I said, $2,000. And then I'm like, I gotta, I've got to call Ann. Here's the craziest part. Ike and I have got to deal with this. They didn't ask Ike, which I don't know how he got out of that deal, but he got out of that deal scot-free. We walked out of the room, was almost $40,000. I can't even enjoy it because I know I've got to call Ann. And we, we just didn't have it. This isn't like I didn't have faith. But we didn't have it. I mean, there was, I got way too much living. I got Casey and Mary Michael. Ann's decided to come home. She's not working anymore. It's just my salary. And it wasn't a ton. I remember going to the elevator and I stopped my friend. I'm like, dude, I am so, so I didn't know. He's like, Mike, it's fine. It was great. I loved it. Hands me an envelope. I wrote you a little thank you card. And got in Ike's truck, Ike's driving home, and I am happy, scared, all the emotions. I'm all the emotions. And I open up my buddy's card, and I pull it out. And it's a check made out to me for the exact amount that I had just said. And this is what he said. I called him. I'm like, dude. He goes, Mike, if you'd have said 20, I'd have given you 20. Ike's like, you dummy? Why didn't you, what were you thinking, man? You could have. You know my lesson in it? I was here. I was the number two guy here. I know how to live here. I'm just telling you, straight up. I walked out of that room and I will never live that way the rest of my life. And I gave, so it wasn't like we didn't tithe. I tithe, gave my first 10. But I learned to live like this. Why? Because God will always give you what you need. How are you going to find out when you try? For some of you, you need to go home today. And you need to say, we need to live there. Take out that North Star app and go, we're going we're to give it a month. We're going to give it a month. We're going to try it for a month. Try it. We're 30 plus years into this journey. I'm just going to tell you, there's joy living here. Number three, ready? Last little point today. Don't forget the leftovers. They all were full 
and there were 12 baskets left. How many disciples, disciples were there? He gave them all one for the journey to remind them I'm enough. Don't ever forget it. If you left here and never came back to North Star, I never saw your face again and you applied this principle. There'll be a day when you're 60, 70 years old, you're gonna come find me, you're gonna go, that could change my life. But you don't know till you try. I'm just telling you. And I have learned, the more I trust, the more God blesses. Now, not, not evangelists, but not, not take all, you gotta live. I'm not, I'm just saying, God built that principle. Give me your first, your 10. So we live off 80 and 70 at times, and we save 20 and give 10, or give 20 and save 10. It's varied back and forth through the years, but it's here. And God always leaves leftovers from a little. I was driving in today. Mom passed in 2017, May. I cannot teach this without thinking of my mother because she left leftovers. We do mom's funeral in May. We divvy up all the family stuff and my brother cut to the chase. He's like, well, all right, we gotta get rid of stuff. And we did all that. It's like, all right. And then we'd get some great, oh, they found your mom had an account at such and such. And we get a little bit. And all I could remember were her words, Mike, you'll never outgive God, so you can't ever stop trying. And months after that lady left, we still got it. She bought, when, it, when our kids were growing up, and I needed to get done, but when our kids were growing up, they, she bought bonds for them. I mean, they started literally when I was a little baby, and then she bought them for our kids, just bonds. She'd just do them. I remember going to the safety deposit box, and, and listen, they lived in the same house from 1973 to 2017. They didn't live great. She bought bonds. Those bonds paid for our kids' weddings. And I could just see her in heaven going, you can't outgive God. I told you. Maybe for some of us, today's the day we start. Would you pray with me? God, may we find full baskets. God, may today we take that step, maybe to sign up for financial peace and go, I gotta get some stuff in order so I can live this way. Or, or we go home as a couple or as a single tonight and I sit down and I look at it and go, all right, Lord, I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna try this. And God, all you want is our heart, not our lunch. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.